This is uh, Rob Wolf, and uh, welcoming uh, listeners to another uh, podcast produced by the Center for Court Innovation. With me today is Nick Herbert, who is a member of parliament, a uh, conservative member of parliament, and uh, currently the shadow justice secretary. Let me first welcome you to, to New York and to, to Brooklyn. Thank you very much for having me. I wanted to uh, just uh, wonder if you could indulge me just for a little bit and give me a little civics lesson and explain what is a shadow minister. Sure. Well, uh, we have uh, the British Parliament, uh, which uh, comprises the elected House of Commons and the unelected uh, House of Lords. And uh, the uh, general election to the House of Commons determines who will uh, form the government, whichever party has the biggest majority forms the government. And for the last 10 years, the Labour Party uh, has had the majority uh, and has therefore formed the government, first with Tony Blair as Prime Minister and now with Gordon Brown. There'll have to be an election uh, within a couple of years. And uh, uh, my party, the Conservative Party, which uh, was led by Margaret Thatcher uh, and is now currently in opposition, is hoping to win the election uh, next time. Uh, and um, our government obviously has ministers, uh, one of those ministers is the uh, Justice Secretary, he's called the Secretary of State for Justice, who's responsible for prisons, courts, probation, okay. uh, oversight of the judiciary. And uh, we have shadow ministers from the opposition party who shadow the government and hold them to account. And actually we are formally called the opposition, Her Majesty's official opposition. And our job is to oppose the government and to hold the government to account on behalf of the public. And, and how does that work? Do you have a critique on every action and decision that the government makes? Well, I expect uh, listeners will have uh, seen the House of Commons and, you know, you have the governing party sits on one side and we sit on the other and we discuss things, debate things across the floor of the House of Commons. I've across seen lots the of shouting when I've seen it. It's on. quite lively. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's deliberately a confrontational uh, d- uh, uh, chamber. Uh, where we get to the bottom of issues by discussing them in a, in a fairly robust uh, manner. So uh, we debate issues in the House of Commons, we vote on legislation, and uh, naturally also we debate issues uh, through, the, through the media. And uh, we have to test the government's legislative program, make sure they can justify it, uh, and uh, hold the government to account for the way in which it's... Uh, running the prison service, uh, running the probation services, and at the same time as holding them to account, we have to come up with ideas of our own, positive ideas for how we would like to change things that we will put to the British public at the next general uh, election. And are your ideas, are there opportunities for your ideas to be incorporated into the government, or are they sort of, you're sort of in a gestational period while you wait and you sort of develop your ideas, you critique what they're doing, but you wait until you are returned to power? There is a a partisan debate, as there is uh, in the United States, which isn't always constructive. But actually, what tends to happen is that the government will then pick up the ideas that it wants to and and, uh, take them on. I think there is probably more that we agree about uh, as political parties in the United Kingdom than disagree about. And so um, I understand you're interested in uh, the concept of community justice, such as it's practiced in... Liverpool, as I understand it, and, and some of that taken from ideas that have been generated here in the United States. And I wonder what interests you about it, and how does it fit in with what uh, your priorities are as far as uh, reforming or improving the delivery of justice? Well, I'm hugely interested in, in the community court, as have other people been in the, in the United Kingdom, and there have been uh, many of my colleagues have, from all parties have come over and seen the community court here. And as you say, it led to the um, formation of the experimental community court in Liverpool uh, back in the, in, in the UK, and I've been up there and met the judge and, and seen uh, all of that too. And I think what drives our interest is that uh, we have um, a rising prison population uh, back at home, Uh, not um, absolutely at the same levels as in the United States, but nevertheless it has risen very sharply. We also have uh, rising rates of re-offending. And I think that there is is now um, 
a general acceptance that uh, you cannot allow the prison population simply to rise indefinitely and that what you should worry about uh, in particular is rates of reoffending, where we have offenders who are cycling back into the system very quickly. Uh, the recidivism rates for adult offenders are 60% within two years are uh, going back into prison. Amongst youth offenders, it's uh, much higher. And what we uh, are interested in uh, is the extent to which we can try and intervene at an earlier stage to secure more uh, effective justice, you could say smarter justice, that is actually going to prevent reoffending, stop people entering the custodial system in the first place, or once they have been in the custodial sentence, try and rehabilitate those offenders and prevent them from reoffending. And what is intriguing about the community uh, court here and in Liverpool is a different approach to courts where courts become problem solving, pulling together a lot of the resources that are necessary to try and help offenders go straight. Are there ideas that you've seen or that you've tossed around that you'd like to see, that you feel confident should be implemented or you'd like to see implemented uh, given the opportunity to implement them? I don't think that we can divorce any uh, ideas from the, the question of cost and that seems to me to be one of the real obstacles to the further development of community courts in the United Kingdom and that's you know, an issue that we're going to have to look at very, very closely. But certainly I, I am very attracted uh, to the notion of accountability, of, of making sure that when uh, a disposal is, is handed down by a court that it actually is meaningful in terms of securing a, a, an outcome, that, uh, that courts aren't just handing down a short-term custodial sentence or a fine or a community order, which in some way is not effective. A fine because it is not paid, as happens in our country. A community order which is ineffective because it is not properly completed, uh, as happens. A drugs rehabilitation requirement which um, is ineffective because it isn't completed and the offender remains on drugs. Now, what I like about uh, the approach we have here is that... Uh, there is a different perspective, which is uh, cases coming back to the court uh, where the judge is actually uh, effectively accountable for whether uh, an offender has got off drugs, uh, whether a, a community service was completed uh, satisfactorily. Drawing together, not just drawing together resources, but also introducing that accountability to make sure that an offender is dealt with properly. And uh, I noticed that you had started, before you became a member of parliament, a think tank called Reform. So I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit about that, why you did that, and, uh, and the work it does. Yeah, well, it hasn't escaped my attention that reform is currently one of the sort of buzzwords uh, in, the, in, in the United States. Um, we started uh, reform a few years ago because there seemed to be only kind of one analysis around uh, in the UK, and that's, that was an analysis that said that our public services were starved of investment, and what they really needed was more resources, and that would make them more effective. And uh, there certainly was a case that some of our public services, including our health system, uh, did need more funding. But we were very concerned that the analysis was uh, a very shallow one and that actually what mattered also was uh, how our public services were organised, yeah. to what extent they were uh, accountable, and whether the big funding increases would deliver high productivity and value for money for the taxpayer. And in the main... I think there's a wide acceptance now in the UK that the very big increases in public spending that we've seen over the last decade have not yielded uh, the improved performance from our schools, from our hospitals, that is proportionate to those spending rises. Um, and the taxpayer has paid a very hefty bill for the increase. And uh, so we wanted to come up with ideas to drive value for money uh, in our public services. And that may mean introducing principles of choice and competition into public services. It may mean that in terms of monopolistic public services, uh, holding them, uh, finding mechanisms to hold them properly to account. Reform is a non-partisan organisation which uh, promotes its ideas to political parties of all persuasions. And what we've found is that these ideas have increasing traction in the UK uh, as um, politicians are confronted with very difficult uh, decisions um, they can't just go on spending more money on services. They have to focus on the outcomes, whether those services are performing well. Just one last question. So what are the prospects for the uh, Conservative Party? Well, uh, at the moment, having been out of office for um, a considerable period of time, over 10 years, uh, the Conservative Party 
Um, we have favourites to win the next general election, uh, which has to be held at the latest by June 2010. So um, a couple of years' time, it could be uh, before that. Having said that, we are not complacent. We have a highly effective young leader of the opposition now, uh, David Cameron. He just featured on the front page of Time magazine, which is a mm. kind, of, you know, a kind of tribute to the fact that he is very much seen as the coming political figure. He's a hugely impressive uh, leader of the opposition, and clearly has the makings and the look of a, a prime minister. But we have an electoral mountain to climb. We have a lot of ground to make up. And in spite of the unpopularity of the current government, which is perhaps not surprising after it's been in power for 10 years and we're now moving into an economic recession, which never makes governments popular, it's very important that we, as the Conservative Party, earn the trust of the British public, that we demonstrate that we have the ideas and the vision to govern the country uh, effectively. It's in the search for these ideas that I find myself here in the uh, community court at Red Hook, um, looking at how things can be done better, and being willing to learn from countries where, where things have been done uh, differently on an entirely non-dogmatic basis, on, on the principle that if it, if it works better, we should be willing to consider it. Very good. Well, it's been very nice talking to you, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your visit to uh, New York and the United States. Thank you very much indeed for having me here. Oh, thanks. This is Rob Wolf, Director of Communications at the Center for Court Innovation. I've been speaking with Conservative Member of Parliament Nick Herbert. To find out more about the Center for Court Innovation, you can visit us at our website, www.courtinnovation.org. Thanks for listening.